Hello, everyone. Welcome to the December 2012 Professor Messer A-plus study group. It's our holiday edition. We're near the end of the year. It's cold outside, or at least it is here in our world headquarters in Tallahassee, Florida. It's about my magic device here tells me that it is 43 degrees Fahrenheit outside. For those of you in the rest of the world, it's about six outside where I am. And we're going to step through our study group for the month where I have taken all of the questions that you have sent me and I've tried to grab as many as I possibly could and put them into this presentation. Of course, I'll be taking questions from the chat room and we'll be going through quite a bit of content. There's a lot been going on in these last few months of the year with the CompTIA a certification, a lot of questions about the content that's on the certification as well as questions about the test itself. And we'll try to hit at least the high points of what you have sent me. If you are watching this live, we have chat rooms going at the bottom of professormesser.com. Those are our 24 by seven chat rooms that you can go into any time of the day and somebody is usually there. You can always ask questions or get a conversation going. I also have this, uh, this running on Ustream. So this month we're gonna try Ustream and see how that works for us. And I'm on the Ustream chat as well. So you only have to put it one place and I'll be able to find it. This is a study group that we do hopefully every month or so. I try to get it done every month as long as we have the time and availability to do it. It is sponsored by, in a way, you, because uh, you are watching these videos online. That helps to support the ProfessorMesser.com site. And for those of you that are offline, there are offline versions available as well. If you'd like to find out how you can get your own DVD-ROMs of the Professor Messer videos for A+, you can visit ProfessorMesser.com slash download dash A+, and you would be able to see that as well. There is also an opportunity here for you if you already have an A-plus certification. You know that if you're participating in the continuing education, that you can use these live events towards the continuing education credits. And if you visit this very long URL, it's probably just easier to Google CompTIA certification, continuing education, and you'll get a frequently asked questions and FAQ so that you can use some of this content. You can't use it to take care of all of the credits that you would need, but it does go towards some of the credits that you would need. And something is better, of course, than, than nothing. You also are going to want to get perhaps your, your uh, QR code readers out because we'll be doing some pop quizzes throughout the session. Of course, you could always just open up a new window in your browser or pop open a browser on your mobile device because there's a very quick shortcut that you can use to get there as well. So get your QR code reader. You can snap a picture of this page and put it right into where you need to be. Or you can simply open up your mobile device. Go to vote.rs, V-O-T.rs. It's going to ask you for a number. That number is 975187, where I'm going to ask you, how long have you been studying for this A-plus certification? I asked this question at the very beginning because I'd like to know as we go through the study group just how many people are studying and at what level you are studying. So obviously this is one of the great reasons to attend our live study groups as you get to participate in this. And I'm going to have many different questions as we go throughout this today. And I'm going to flip over to my browser on the screen and let's bring up the views of what we've seen so far. So those of you that are online, you should be able to see exactly how many are doing what. And you can imagine there's certainly people that are starting off that are trying to learn the A-plus certification at the very beginning. I always find it interesting that some people have been doing this over a long period of time. Those are my people because I tend to study very slowly. I tend to get going and going, but there's life that happens around us. There are things that, that ca call us away from our certification studies and things that call us back. So I tend to study for these things gradually over a long period of time. And we have a few of you out there as well. We've got some that are less than a month. We've got some that are nine to 12 months. So it's nice to be able to get that perspective of what we are doing with this. 
we're going to go through a number of topics today. We're going to talk about not just things that you've asked about what's on the exam, but I'm also going to talk to you about things that we are seeing with changes to the exam. And as some of you have seen, we are now using the 800 series exam as the primary A plus exam, but also the 700 series exam is available. What are the differences? What are some of the things I need to look out for? What is some of the new content that I need to look out for? We're going to cover all of that in today's study group. So don't worry, we will be getting to all of those pieces and see exactly what is covered and where it's covered from. Well, thanks for having uh, the time to, to vote. You can see we've got five people less than a month, and we've got a good smattering of folks that are everywhere from six months to more than a year. So we've got a nice grouping of people in the study groups today. What we're going to do is focus on topics that will apply to all of you when we do those types of things. Let's look at what the A-plus update is about. There is a new exam, as I mentioned. You can take the 220, what they call the 22801 and the 22802. I call those the 800 series exam. You can take those right now. You can sign up for them and take, it is the newest exam. It's been out for about three months or so now. So it is a relatively new exam that's available, but you can still take the previous exam. This is one of the big challenges, of course, if you're studying for your 700 series and finally you suddenly realize there's a new exam available with different content on it. You don't want to lose all of that study time that you've spent. So what CompTIA has done is made the 700 series exam available until August 31st. There's a huge ramp for you. So if you want to still take the 700 series exam, you absolutely can. So this is very, very useful, especially if you're like me and you're you're having the biggest problems with trying to get that, that time to study you've got until August. But of course, August will be here before we ever, ever are making that time available. So you want to be sure to study and take that as soon as you can. So you have a choice. You can take the 700 series or you can take the 800 series. And which one you take is a question that we'll try to answer throughout this study group today. But keep in mind that you can't mix and match these. You can take the 701 and the 702, and that will give you an A-plus certification. You can take the 801 and the 802, and that will give you the A-plus certification. But you cannot take the 701 and the 802 or the 801 and the 702. You can't change and mix and match those. They are very, very different exams in the type of content. They are not simple upgrades to the existing exam. They are upgrades and things have been moved around. So they are not compatible with each other in those ways. So make sure that you keep that in mind because I don't want you taking the 701 and thinking, well, after August, I'll take the 802 and I'll have my A-plus exam. You won't. If you've taken the 701 and you wait until the end of August and the exam is retired, then you can't take the 702 and you have to start all over again. So that's an important consideration if you are planning to do exactly that. The uh, other piece that you might want to consider because the topics have been switched around in the chat room, you guys are mentioning, yes, it's, it's not really practical and essentials and it's all mixed up. Uh, with different topics and different domains on the different exams now, go to CompTIA's website, download the requirements. That will not be the last time I tell you to do that in this study group. Well, let's do a pop quiz. Let's see if we've got our, our VOT.RS. I noticed in the chat room some of you are trying to get there. Make sure it's VOT.RS, and I want to find out what port is commonly used for IMAP. IMAP, the IMAP protocol which has nothing to do with maps, but it's called IMAP. So that's just one of those quirks of networking. Grab your QR code reader, snap a shot of that QR code, or go to vote.rs, V-O-T.rs, and go to the vote.rs of 961071. So no cheating. Don't say it in the, in the, in the chat rooms. Nobody mention what the answer is. It's going to be a secret. So go to vote.rs, 961071. 071. And while you are doing that, I will do the same thing on my side. And we'll see if I can, can pull up that particular vote. We're going to see what people are finding when they vote on their list. Here's what we have so far. The choices are TCP 443, UDP 53, TCP 3389, TCP 143, and TCP 110. Aha, uh -huh. so 
we have uh, a little mixing and matching there. This is one of those things that tends to come up if you're configuring a firewall, if you need to configure the settings inside of a mail client, if you're trying to get Google Mail to talk to your internet provider's mail so you can bring all of that mail over periodically, these are important things to know. So this is one of those types of things. Let's go through these port numbers, TCP port 443 is in most cases the well-known port for HTTPS. So that's secure web browsing. That's not IMAP. UDP port 53, I got somebody to bite on that one. That is DNS or our general DNS queries that we make. TCP 3389, that sounds like it would be something like remote desktop. And that's absolutely correct. And TCP slash 110, we certainly don't see that often as we should with because that's pop three. We don't see a lot of people doing pop three anymore, but TCP 143. Now I didn't fool very many of you. Most of you said, Oh, that's that's IMAP. I'm good with IMAP. IMAP port is uh is exactly what I would like it to be. And that's uh TCP 143. So make sure that you look over these. And this is by the way, IMAP in the clear. There's a different IMAP for secure settings. You're not asked that in the CompTIA A plus requirements. So I didn't put that on here. Uh, but one of the things that's important to know, and one of the things that's new, especially in the 800 series A plus exam is that you know common port numbers. So some of you in the chat room are going, wait a second, that sounds like a new piece of information that I need to know. If you're taking the 700 series exam, there is less of an emphasis in networking. But obviously, networking, huge. It's a big piece of what we're doing. So in the 800 series exam, common port numbers is absolutely a piece of information that you will need to know. So keep that in mind as we are going through the process of finding out what's new. You're going to think to yourself, I haven't seen that content before. And it's entirely possible you haven't because it's new on the 800 series exam. Let's now go into some of the questions that you have sent me. Uh, some of the things that you have, have sent over to me deal specifically with questions on the exam. And a lot of the questions that are new on the exam, for instance, this is not really a new thing, but yet it kind of is. This is a very common question that I get. This is, what kind of processors do I need to know? This is really a challenging question because in the past, CompTIA has not given you a lot of guidance on what processors and what type of processor sockets you need to know for the exam. And if you open up an A plus certification book, you've got pages and sometimes multiple pages of processors and sockets that you're wondering, do I need to know all of these things? This is, this is a lot of information. And fortunately, in the latest 800 series exam, CompTIA now tells you exactly what you need to know for the exam. So that part's very, very useful to have to be able to understand that. For instance, let's look at the list of processors that are on the CompTIA exam requirements document. Now, the list for the Intel processors, you can see that we have the sockets listed on the left side, the type of socket, when those were released, which I'm not sure is exactly a piece of information you're going to need to know for the exam, but certainly the type of sockets and the type of processors that go in there and the processor or the socket type, those are important things to know. So from an Intel perspective, you only have to know four of them. That's it. That's one of those things that that is nice. It's listed out in the exam requirements. You need to know socket T, socket B, socket H, socket H2. It tells you. So that's a real benefit of the 800 series exam is you know what they're being, what they're asking of you, what you are being asked of. Now, one of the things to keep in mind is that you can't rely on this to be the only thing they would ask. You'll notice in the CompTIA exam requirements documentation that they have a section in there that says at the beginning, this is what we list as being our requirements, but we could ask you things that are outside of this. Now, what we found in practice is that is not necessarily the case. They tend to stay very, very close to the exam requirements. So if you are thinking of doing something like that, you absolutely, absolutely can find a way to make that happen. So that's one of those things that I find is incredibly useful whenever you are, are looking through and trying to find out what you want to do. And 
Um, you're looking to know exactly which processors. Here's a list of the AMD processors, for instance. The AMD processors, a few more of those, isn't it? A few extras on that list. So I think that there's. it's important to, to keep in mind that it's not always just Intel. There are also other processors as well, a lot more, almost twice as many on the AMD side. Now, one of the benefits you'll notice is that on the AMD side, the socket numbers and the types the 940 socket has 940 pins. So things like that may help you get a feel for, get your arms around this content. Completely spelled out in the CompTIA exam requirements. So if you're missing this information or trying to figure out what flashcards you should make or what you should study, they are all in there. Yeah, good point that is made in the chat room. They're almost all PGA sockets except for socket F. So that's another one. It helps you remember a little bit better since there's so many similarities throughout all of that. Very good point. Thank you, chat room. My other brain. Now, another thing I'm going to mention about the sockets and about the processors and those types of things, and this is incredibly important, is not to dwell, not to spend all of your study time on all of these things. There's a lot of detail in here. And if you end up spending days trying to memorize sockets, you could have been using that time to study other topics. And I mentioned this because the, the type of information that you're going to be asked about sockets is just a tiny little piece of a number of sections that are in an entire domain that are part of a larger exam. So you might not even get a question about sockets. You might not even get a question about CPUs. People have, have gone into our chat room and said, yeah, I never even got a question. I spent days studying my CPUs, and I got no questions about CPUs. How frustrating would that be? So don't go overboard. Don't try to figure out exactly what's going to be going on here that you need to do. You should just study and get the idea of what's there. You can always come back to this. I feel that if you are spending too much time on this, you may be wasting some of that time. So keep that in mind as you go through the process of trying to understand what do I need to know about sockets, make it realistic, maybe do some flashcards, but don't waste all of your time trying to memorize all of those processors and sockets in the CompTIA exam requirements. Let's continue on with a question. On here we have a question. This is also new content in the 800 series exam, although there's some content also going back to the 700 series as well. But I'm this one specifically, I'm going to focus on what you need to know for the 800 series exam. What laser printer parts do we need to know about? Well, that's a good one. A laser printer, of course, is something we see a lot in our enterprise environments. These days, you even see it in a home office or even in a home environment because they are printing with a very crisp, very clear type of text on the page. They also print very fast in many cases as well. But you've now got a device that has laser beams inside of it. You have lots of high voltage to run this device because there's a lot of heat involved. And there's a lot of ink, this powdered ink, this toner that we have inside of them keeps a, a very big challenge to be able to do that. But you get a beautiful piece of output from this. Very, very high quality output with a very detailed dots per inch. So it makes a very nice output if you need that functionality. And gener generally, it prints very fast. It prints an entire page at a time, unlike an inkjet, where it's printing just a little bit at a time as the pages come through. So that makes it very, very useful to have. Unfortunately, it's a very mechanical device. There are a lot of moving parts in a laser printer. And as you can think to yourself, if there are a lot of moving parts, there's a lot of pieces that can break. And if you've ever worked on a laser printer, you know that's absolutely the case. There's so many different opportunities for something to go wrong. And that's why we have a job. That's why we are getting these certifications. That's why we have that job security, because things break. It also needs a lot of memory. I mentioned a laser printer prints an entire page at a time. It has to render the entire page in memory and only then can you print it out. Now, if you're printing text, it takes no time at all and very little memory to render text. But let's say you're printing some type of architectural diagram. Let's say you're printing out a network map. Let's say you're printing out some blueprints. Those types of things are very graphical. And the more graphical and complex the page, the more it takes to render and the more memory you're going to need to be able to do that. Also, this toner and the paper and all of the things on the inside of the printer can often get pretty messy. So uh, make sure you have some gloves before you go in to take care of those things or you're going to get toner everywhere 
when you work on those pieces. There are some new components that you have to know about when you get into the 800 series exam. Here's an example of what those are. I have listed out every component on the 800 series. This is the 801 exam has a section on printers. These are the components of a laser printer that are listed in that section of the CompTIA Plus requirements. The first is the laser printer imaging drum. This is the drum that the laser hits to be able to, to effectively write the information that we're ev eventually going to have toner stick to. So we are using this, this very uh, light sensitive drum to be able to put that information on. You would never put a drum like this out in the open where the light is hitting it. This is something, if you look at a toner cartridge, they're often combined with the toner cartridge, and there's a flap that covers it. And if you lift it up, you can kind of see it, but you don't want to leave that out in the light. It is very photosensitive. And if you have light hit it, it will be worthless to you. So make sure that uh, this is not something you are doing in your environment. You very often never even see it. But if you look closely, you can find it. It's somewhere in your laser printer. And sometimes it's a separate piece, maybe a separate piece that you can pull out and put in. Depends on the laser printer model and exactly how it works. Another device you'll need to know, another component of a laser printer you'll need to know is the laser printer fuser assembly. The fuser is a component that is responsible for taking the, the information that's on the toner after it's been put on a sheet of paper, and it effectively heats it up and melts the toner and pushes it right onto the page. It permanently fastens that ink to the paper itself. So this is one that is squeezing the paper. There's a lot of heat inside of it. It's rolling the paper through. And when you get it, if you ever feel the laser printer output when it first comes out, it's a little warm. That's because there's a laser printer fuser assembly inside of that that is heating everything up. If you find that the paper is coming out and it's not heated up and, and all of the toner smears all over the place on the page, then you have a problem with your laser printer toner assembly and you will want to replace it. Another piece of the laser printing process, this is one you don't commonly see in a black and white laser printer. This is commonly seen in a color laser printer is the laser printer transfer belt. This is a belt that effectively takes all of the different colors across all of the toners because you can't put a black toner in the same container as a red toner and the blue toner and you stick it all together. Uh, it all has to be separate toners. It has to be separated out and you're effectively putting the different colors onto a page. What the laser printer transfer belt will do is go by all of those different colors so that the entire piece of toner is now on the transfer page and it transfers it to the paper. So if you're looking in your black and white printer and you're wondering, where's my laser printer transfer belt? I don't see anything like that. That's probably why. That's also another reason that you see those color laser printers a little bit bigger than our black and white laser printers. If that's the case, it's probably because there are more pieces inside like this laser printer transfer belt. Another component we're going to need to know about, and this is important when we go into troubleshooting printers, that's more in a separate part of the CompTIA requirements, are these laser printer pickup rollers. You can see one that's right here. That allows you to grab the paper. If you ever look at that, it's very rough. If you put your finger on it, it's something that would, you would be able to see that the paper would stick to very easily if paper was rolling across it. If you're having problems with multiple pieces of paper coming through your printer, or maybe it's not sending any paper through your printer, you may have a problem with that pickup roller. It's very common when you're doing maintenance on a laser printer that they send along with the maintenance kit additional rollers. They just assume it's getting old, just swap it out. Just And they're designed so that you can Take them out relatively easily and put another one in so that you have a fresh roller and you're not having a lot of misfeeds as the paper is going through there. Along the same lines, there is another component that is the laser printer separation pad. If you were to look at the sheets of paper that you're putting into the tray, this is usually part of that tray, and it's in the very back. You can kind of see the separation pad here. Let's zoom up a bit. The separation pad is right here. It's this tiny little pad. You can almost miss it. If you've never looked for it before, you probably didn't even know it was there. But your laser printer separation pad is very, very useful for being able to grab one sheet of paper and send it along. It very often works with the rollers to grab just one sheet of paper. And again, if you're getting multiple sheets of paper or no sheets of paper, make sure you have your separation pad cleaned off. Make sure that it's, it's working properly. And that's another component they usually send with a maintenance kit so you can replace that as well. 
And the last component that is part of the a requirements laser printer assemblies are the laser printer duplexing assembly. Not, not all laser printers have this. Sometimes it's an option. Sometimes it's something you can add on afterwards. Sometimes you have to buy the printer with this functionality. But this can be a cost saver because this allows you to print out a sheet of paper. And then inside of the printer, it will turn the paper over and it will print on the other side. So instead of wasting an entire sheet of paper to just print on one side of the paper, I can now print on both sides of the paper as it's going through the laser printer. Sometimes it pulls it out and sticks it in and spins it around and does it a different way. Sometimes the paper has a different path. If it's a very large industrial printer, you don't often have a duplexing assembly. You have two separate assemblies to do the actual printing of the paper. But in most enterprise and home office laser printers that you see sitting on a desk somewhere, they're using some type of duplexing assembly to be able to move that paper and switch it around so you could print on the other side of it. And when the paper comes out, you now have a printout that has occurred on both sides of the paper. So if you're looking for content on what you need to know from a laser printer perspective, this should be able to cover the bases for your A plus 801 exam. Let's go ahead and look at what this month's acronym might be. And of course, I call this our section called the TMA for this month's acronym. So this month, our acronym is RDP. Don't say it in the chat room. Do not give the answer. Miguel asked, what's RDP? What is that? And I don't want you to give the answer because I want you to vote on it. Go to vote.rs, V-O-T.rs, and use the number 679099. Or while I've got this on the screen, take a snapshot of that and be able to see what it is. We want to see what RDP is and be able to go to vote.rs679099 to be able to see that. And while you are doing that, I'm going to switch over to that page so we can see that very thing. And once I bring it up here, that number will be back there. I have to pick the right one here on my screen so you can all see that piece. What is RDP? So as you look at this, Many of you will decide, well, I think I might know the answer based on what other people might be saying. I didn't fool very many people with this month's acronym, RDP, our remote desktop. We've got 18 people that have said, oh, it's the remote desktop protocol. A couple, three folks said remote diagnostics program. Those people are strong. They're, they're sticking with their remote diagnostics program. Nobody's bitten on render device process, the random device processor, or the reserved disk protection, and probably because this is a pretty common protocol. The remote desktop protocol is the correct answer. It is the one that you see very often being used when people need to be able to connect to a remote device and be able to use that remote device out in their environments. In fact, RDP is one that I commonly use all the time in my environment. I have many different machines on many different computers. I have virtual devices that are running. I have real devices that are here. I've got devices across the internet that I need to access via remote desktop. And this is the protocol that allows me to do that. Inside of Windows, there's a program called the Remote Desktop Connection that allows you to connect to a remote device. And it uses that RDP protocol to be able to do that. This is one of those good examples of being able to sit in one place and connect to many different devices out there, many different Windows versions. Uh, you, you can now even connect to just an application that might be on a remote device. This brings up a whole new world in virtualization because some of my applications may not be on my desktop anymore. They may be somewhere else. And that somewhere else can uh, provide me with just that application view on my screen. Very, very efficient, allows you to manage your applications in one place, but gives the user the same experience as clicking an icon and starting up the app as they always do, they may not even realize that the application is really being used on a different device completely. Very, very nice to have that capability. This is a question in the chat room that Rob asks, which is, what kind of security concerns might RDP represent? Well, obviously, there are security concerns here because you have to have a username and a password to be able to access that device. But what if somebody doesn't set up their username and password properly? A huge security flaw that was found or a security problem that was found uh, may not have been this calendar year, but the previous calendar year was with a restaurant chain that had their 
point of sale systems that their managed point of sale systems in all of their stores had remote desktop loaded, but had used the same password or in some cases no password to access it. And it was very, very easy for the bad guys to collect credit card numbers by using remote desktop to get into the device, plant their credit card uh, surfing utility. They disconnect from remote desktop and now their utility is there just sending across the credit card numbers. Huge security concern there. So you want to make sure you have username and password set up. The protocol itself encrypts the data and the data that is there is also something that it's not real word. You're seeing parts of a screen come back in some cases. So it, even if you looked at the stream, it may not be obvious, but as an extra step, the information within there is encrypted as well. So very, very useful to be able to have that remote desktop, but also keep in mind there may be security concerns or things you need to keep in mind if you're planning to implement this, certainly over a large scale. This is also useful in other operating systems other than Windows. I can be on a Mac OS X device and I can connect to a Windows device. I can use a Linux machine and connect to one of these devices. And even though I'm not using the same operating system or even the same family of operating systems, it's simply a remote screen. It's a remote desktop. So having this functionality on your mobile device, you can be on a tablet and connect to a third-party device using the remote desktop protocol. Very, very, very useful to do that. And always using TCP 3389 to make that happen. Let's go to our next question. This came from Rhonda that asked, what are the differences between Windows workgroups and a Windows domain? This is something that you commonly see when you're configuring your Windows device. It asks you, oh, what workgroup would you like to belong to? What domain would you like to belong to? That is one of those things that provides uh, some functionality that's a lot different between the two. So let's step through just real quick what each of these might be. Let's also throw into the mix this new idea of a home group. Although Rhonda didn't ask about that, there is work group, there is home group, and there is domain functionality within Microsoft Windows. Let's go through all three of those. The work group is what was around very early on with Windows. Some of the very first versions of Windows used this concept of a work group. In a work group, every device is a peer to every other device. In a way, every computer stands alone on the, on the network. Every computer has their own account list. And in that account list are its own set of passwords. And every machine is responsible for providing resource access to the resources or printer that's associated with that device. That is, is easy to use and manage if you have one machine, two machines, three machines, maybe four or five. But imagine if you now had to change a password for one user in your environment. You have to go to all five devices and change the password on all five devices. Or you may have different passwords on every single device that's there. It's not a centralized environment. Every machine is its own world, and they don't talk to each other. They don't coordinate usernames. They don't share passwords amongst those. And as it, it's one of those things that can be very, very difficult to manage, especially on a larger scale. So you don't tend to see work groups being used in a very large environment just because of the, the difficulties getting something like that to be able to scale. What we commonly see in enterprise environments is something called a Windows domain. This is where everything is centrally managed. You have servers that are responsible for making sure that all the usernames and passwords are synchronized. You can manage what people's computers can do or not do, their permissions, their rights. You can manage how people can use their user interface in their device. This is very, very useful to be able to do that. In the chat room, they even say, but in a domain, people still use the same password over and over again. If you're on a domain, your domain administrator can say, I want you to change your password every 15 days, and you have to change it to something different. I'm going to remember nine of your last passwords, and you can't use any of those last passwords. And you can adjust those time frames. You can adjust the number of days. You can adjust how many passwords it remembers. You can adjust the complexity of what the password might be. There's a lot of 
value in larger, really middle to large environments of having this domain. In some cases, a small environment could benefit from this because you can now manage from one central place. You don't have to get everybody's computer. You don't have to even touch anyone's computer. You can push software. You can change certificates in a device. You can manage what people see on their screen. Very, very powerful. This is one of the reasons that Microsoft has such a large view, a large impact, a large install base in these enterprise environments is because they make it so easy to set up thousands of computers and manage them from one place. That's pretty powerful. That's some good stuff. And that is why there is such value in having a domain like that. Very, very, very useful. Now, there's a new capability in Windows called a home group. If you use Windows 7 or Windows 8, you have seen this home group capability. The home group is a way that you can have all of the devices on your network, your home network, thus the name home group, and your home network has a, a main password, a main set of authentication. When you add a device to a home group, it says, what's the home group password? And you can just specify a single password. And so it's kind of a mix between a work group and, a, and it's a mix between that and a domain where there's some centralized management between all of them. But what it's really allowing you to do is to access different resources. It's really designed so that you're able to set up a central place to store all of your music and everybody in the house can listen to that music. A central place to store all of your pictures and everybody in the house can access those pictures with one single password. Makes it very, very easy to manage that way. Makes it really easy to manage that way. Keep in mind that home group computers are often also a member of a work group as well. You just don't even want to use that work group. You don't have to. Just use the home group functionality. Think of it as an easier and nicer and more open way to allow the people you need to access devices in your house. And then as long as you keep that private, you can then... Uh, access other capabilities. Maybe certain people in the house can go and see pictures, but they can't delete pictures. So you still have some control there, but it's an easier way to gain access to those pieces. Very, very useful. Questions in the chat room. One of the questions, so domain, domains are more system administrator. Well, as, as the name implies or as the description of a domain implies, yes, that is a much larger scale. There are entire Microsoft certifications built around how you would configure, set up, and manage Active Directory Domains, and that is the term that Microsoft uses for their name services, is Active Directory. That is your Windows domain. So it's a pretty complex world, especially when you start connecting other domains to yours. A lot of trust that you have to know about. It's difficult enough just to manage one domain. Imagine trying to manage multiple domains out there in the world. And Microsoft World becomes extremely complex to do that. Another question in the chat room is what's required then to set up that domain? Well, you would need a Windows server that's able to run those name services, that Active Directory server. So if you have really any Windows domain server or any Windows server, like Windows Server 2008, that's a very good example of somebody who can load up a server, and that server can be your Active Directory server, and it can handle all of the management of your domain. Very, very, very useful to have that capability as well. That's uh, one of those things that, that when you start getting into especially larger enterprises and they ask, what's your domain admin login? Or how can I configure those domain configurations inside of this tree that we have built for Microsoft? Now you're getting into those domain services questions. Relatively complex world sometimes. Sometimes in a small business, very easy. The larger businesses, larger enterprises, extremely complex. So very useful bit of information to know. If you, if you know Active Directory really, really, really well, you are a very, very valuable person to your enterprise. So if you're into Microsoft or you think you might want to go into doing something with server management or management of an enterprise, that's a very, very good place to go to learn more about Active Directory and domain services in a Windows environment. Let's look at some more things with A+, but before we do, one of the questions I got, this did not come from one person. This did not come from two people. This question came from everybody, it seems, is what resources do I recommend for studying up for the A+. There are a lot of books out there, 
Obviously, I spent time creating an entire video series. And of course, we're updating that video series. Currently, you can see we have videos available for the 801 and the 802 is coming very, very quickly. So I've spent a lot of time building the videos, but there's a lot more opportunities out there to gather information and learn from what you're doing. One of the things that I recommend and one of the people that sponsor the study group are the folks at GTS Learning. They have a technology that they've built all in the cloud called Freestyle. Imagine not carrying around a book, not having to download anything. Imagine having all of the resources available right in your browser to read entire documents, entire books that are available to you online. Imagine if my videos were built right into the book so you could watch those as you go. What if your, your quizzes and your sample exam tests were all also available? That's exactly what Freestyle is. It's a one-stop shop to see everything you would need to know about working on your certification. Freestyle is a, a front end to uh, your browser, so it's exceptionally easy to use. It's one of those things where it's, it's amazing they, that I think they've really thought of it first, to put everything in one place. They've done a great job of this. I'm going to log into my Freestyle and let you see it. I've got mine up on the screen. Let's have a look at what's there. This freestyle, I have a number of courses on mine. But let's say we're taking our 702 series exam. I'm going to click on that piece. The entire exam is right here online. If you wanted to look at Module 1 of Supporting Windows, let's click on Module 1. And you get some options here of what you'd like to do. Let's do some review questions right now that deal with that piece of it. Or maybe I'm not ready for that. Maybe what I'd like to do instead is to go look at more information about that Unit 1 and understand more about how to use Windows. So here is everything you would get if you were reading an actual book. They've taken their books, which, by the way, are CompTIA certified, and they put them right here online. And another thing you'll notice, it went by pretty quick. I'll flip by this back at the top of the screen. So as you're reading, you can also watch the video associated with that and see how that works out for you, too. I've got every single one of the videos on here. My 800 series videos will go into the 800 series pieces. So that's another great opportunity to learn more about what you need and have everything in one place. I really like what they've done here with the GTS Learning. Those folks have done a great job at putting together the freestyle. And we certainly appreciate their sponsorship of our CompTIA a study group. They have been around and helped us for well over a year now. Uh, it's great to have them with us. And I really like what they've created. There is a trial. If you go to professormesser.com slash freestyle, you can try this yourself. And uh, they've got a sample on there that you can have a look and see if you like it. They also have uh, sample exams that you can try. They also have vouchers that you can purchase. It's a one-stop shop. Everything you need right there at GTS Learning. You can find out more at professormesser.com slash freestyle. Let's also now since we have an opportunity here, let me give you another pop quiz. Here's a good one since we're talking about different aspects of the exam and things that you can do. This is a pretty good one called SATA. How many drives can you attach to a single SATA interface? Go ahead and hit your QR code reader or go to vote.rs, vot.rs, and use the number 149602. That's 149602 to find out. How many drives can you attach to a SATA interface? Now, I'm giving you on that view some options. So uh, one of the things that, uh, that you'll see here, so let me bring up how many drives can you attach so that we can all see it at the same time. You have the option of choosing 1, 2, 4, or 16. How many SATA drives can you attach to a single SATA interface? And this is another one of those questions that I suspect I didn't fool many people, and indeed, I did not. The number of drives for that interface, you can go to 149602 at vote.rs. Very, very nice. One drive is what you can connect to one SATA interface. This is a little different. In the past, we've had PATA or the ATA or the IDE. It's all the same thing. Those have allowed two drives on a single interface on my motherboard. Some like SCSI, I can fit up to 16 drives. Or, or perhaps in some cases with FireWire, even more than that onto one interface. But as far as SATA is concerned, the serial connection is simply one connection. You go right to not, then you can see 19 people said, yeah, it's just one. That's all you're going to fit. It's one cable. You plug it into the motherboard. You plug it into the drive, and you're done. There's no other opportunity, and that's it. You don't have an option. You can't split it. You can't find some 
additional aggregator port that you can add to it doesn't work that way. So, uh, in fact, in the chat room, everybody's going, oh, he mentioned SCSI. I haven't heard that in a while. Well, one of the things you'll notice on the 800 series exam, SCSI has now come back. It wasn't on the 700 series. It's now on the 800 series. And be, the reason, I, I believe, the primary reason we're seeing it is not because we're interested in learning about that, that interface type that's been around forever. And it's also not because people are buying SCSI drives and SCSI interfaces because they aren't. The reason SCSI has now taken a new importance in the enterprise, it is the, the preferred method of creating virtual drives in virtual environments. And for people that are doing virtualization, I say people that are doing, everybody's doing virtualization. Who am I fooling? Every enterprise, small business, large business, doesn't matter, are working in virtual environments these days. And the way that disks are accessed and the way that partitions on those disks are accessed is via SCSI. Because SCSI allows you such a, an opportunity. It's a pretty complex protocol, but that complexity gives you power. And so having that SCSI built into virtualization allows you to do some really interesting things in a virtual environment. It's going to be really, really, really important for you to know about SCSI and how it operates. Uh, when you start setting up, you'll go into an environment and you're, you'll start setting up a virtual machine. You're thinking, look at all these SCSI logical units on this device. I need to know about SCSI logical units so I understand what I'm looking at. That's the reason we're doing more SCSI these days. So uh, so on our answer to this one, we have uh, one drive that we can attach to SATA, and obviously SCSI very different. But of course, I have a video on the 801 series that talks all about the SCSI protocol, the SCSI interfaces, as well as SATA and as well as PATA. Make sure you look at all of those. On this section of the study group, I'd like to talk more about your questions about the exam. So let me flip over to our exam questions and we'll see some of this. Some of the questions that I get, uh, I get a lot. So I think I'm going to create some frequently asked questions videos for you to be able to do that. Oh, let me, let me flip back to the, uh, to some of the things in the chat room before we go too far outside our, our storage scope. Uh, one of the things, uh, is the speed associated with these technologies. Well, if we're talking physical environment, there's speeds, but when you're talking in a virtual environment, completely different world. So it's getting harder and harder to take those different technologies and compare them these days, especially when they become virtual, because then we're not dealing with bus speed anymore. We're dealing with something that doesn't actually exist. It's a virtual environment. Very interesting to see those scenarios as they, they crop up and how we can work with those. Um, and indeed, you know, some of those people that are dealing in those environments, very complex. So the more you know about those technologies, the better. Some of the questions about the exam. Is there a big difference between the 700 series exam and the 800 series exam? Martin asked this question. And the, the question is incredibly important because there are some big differences. There are some minor differences. And before you walk into any of these exams, you're going to need to know what those differences are. Now, if you go to my 800 series videos, I have a link right at the top that says, here's the differences between the two. It's a little bit involved because it takes one of our previous study groups and I go into a lot of detail. If you want a lot of detail, that's the one for you. But let me summarize for you very quickly what some of those differences are. First, there's a new structure. It uses similar content but it is laid out in a different format. So the things that are on the 701 exam, a completely different set of topics on the 801 exam. And the topics on the 702 exam, completely different set of topics on the 802 exam. So before with 701 and 702, 701 was learning about the, the information and 702 was troubleshooting the information. Now it's completely different. Now it's split up into simple domains. So you're going to want to look at your exam requirements to understand that piece. There's also updated technologies on these. For instance, the, the 800 series exam does not include Windows 2000, even though I swear to you this year, I saw many people on planes boot up their laptops that have Windows 2000 on them. I am not making this up. So you still see it out there, but even CompTIA has realized the number of those devices has greatly diminished. Let's not even worry about learning uh, the Windows 2000 for our 800 series exam. And just like the 700 series where you needed to know Windows 7, you still need to know Windows 7 for the 800 series exam. At this point, you don't need to know Windows 8. 
And in some of the chat room, they say, well, they might ask you about Windows 8. If they do, they're outside the scope of the exam requirements. But keep in mind, this Windows 7 was not part of the 700 series exam when they released it. About a year after release, they added Windows 7. They slipstreamed it right in, did not change the number of the exam, did not change the version of the exam. If you weren't looking at the exam requirements, you would never know they had a Windows 7. I suspect we may be seeing something like that with Windows 8. I have no idea what they're planning at CompTIA. I have no association with them, but they did it with the previous exam. There's no reason they couldn't do it with this new exam as well. But currently, it is not part of the exam. Windows 8 is not part of the 800 series exam currently. And, and if you're watching this in a replay, make sure you go look and see if they've added it. Don't want to tell you something wrong as we go through all of these things in the future. There is also a really big emphasis in networking and security that we didn't see on the 700 series exam. The brand new exam has a lot more networking questions and a lot more security questions. So I think that's a very good thing. I think we need to know about networking. I think we need to know more about security, especially these days. So make sure you look at those pieces as well. There is also a brand new section on the 800 series exam on mobile devices. So they're going to expect that you know about iOS, that you know about Android, especially as it relates to networking security and the synchronization of data on those devices. Pretty important. I see that challenge all the time where people have information in Microsoft Outlook, in Google Mail, and Google Contacts, and Google Calendar, and they want to get that on their mobile device. How do they make that happen? How do you troubleshoot that if there's a problem? Very, very important to keep that in mind when you're using that. And there's a brand new emphasis on troubleshooting on the 800 series exam. You need to know how to troubleshoot when you have network problems, how to troubleshoot when you have hardware problems. And there are brand new exam question types. There's something called the performance based questions. They're not just going to give you multiple choice on the 800 series exam. They are just, they're going to give you questions where they're going to say, how can I send a ping to this device? I have a list of four devices. How do I match those four devices with the type of memory they would use? I have these sockets. What processor should I put with those sockets? You have to draw lines between them. You don't have those multiple choice questions. There are a few of those that will be added or are added to the 800 series exam. They are also added to the Network Plus and Security Plus exams as well. Uh, from what I have read, and I've not got verification of this yet, there is no plans to do that with these 700 series exams. So if you're a little wary of these performance-based questions and you'd like to take an exam that was pure multiple choice, maybe you'd like to take the 700 series exam. If you'd like to just get an idea of what those performance-based questions are like, CompTIA has a video they've created that, that, uh, that provides you with a sample of what some of these might be. Just go to YouTube, look for CompTIA performance-based questions. I'll put a link certainly in the notes for this so that you can easily find it from the study group as well. We talked with it in a previous study group too. And, uh, and lastly, uh, just know that the content between the two isn't really much harder or much easier between those. In fact, the content between the two, although it's structured differently, is still about 80 to 85% exactly the same. You know, laser printers haven't changed in three years. There's no dramatic change to laser printing technology. The things you needed to know about laser printers on your 700 series are the same things that you need to know on your 800 series, at least for the most part. Some of the things that you need to know about how a computer starts up, what is a BIOS, uh, what is a SATA drive, almost identical on both exams. So things like that are, uh, are very, very important to keep in mind. But it's that 20% that's different that you need to make sure you know about. Do not study for the 700 series exam and go take the 800. Do not study for the 800 series exam and go take the 700. There's some, a huge amount of information you'll miss completely on that exam. Always grab content, information, your books, everything you're studying from. Look at those exam numbers. Make sure that they match up. Very, very, very important if you're planning to do that. Another question that came in, if you pass the 701, can you just take the 802 exam and be A plus certified? We just talked about that. And the answer, of course, is no. If you take the 701, you have to take the 702. If you take the 702, you have to take the 701. You can take them in any order. And you can take them as far apart as you'd like. You can, you can, if you took the 700 series exam two years ago, you can still take the, the other exam that you need to pair it up. But you have to take 701 and 702 or 801 and 802. You can't mix and match. 
So make sure you keep that in mind. Make sure you sign up for the right exam. I would hate to see you pass the 701 and then go take the 802 and think you're A-plus certified and you realize you're not. You have to make sure you sync those up and use exactly the same kind in both. Another question for you, a pop quiz. And the pop quiz question is, what network utility can be used to identify all of your computer's network connections? Now, this is an interesting one. I mentioned that there are a lot more networking questions on the A-plus exam, the 800 series. And this is one of those you may be asked. This was actually on the 700 series as well. So it's not too far out of the scope, not too brand new. If you're studying for both, you should be able to answer this. Go to vote.rs, vot.rs, numbers 918 six two five nine one eight six two five to be able to answer the question about all these computer connections now if you've been doing networking you've had to troubleshoot networks you've had to work on networks before this one may be relatively obvious to you this is a really useful utility as well if you start working with troubleshooting a lot of networks especially if you're troubleshooting from a security perspective and you're noticing that your computer is sending out information to somewhere you did not expect. Maybe it's going to a botnet. Maybe it's just something you weren't expecting. What application is causing this information to go out over my network connection? And you've got some choices here of traceroute, the net command, the net stat command, the IP config command, and the ping command. Oh, this is one we've got a, a mixed case here. Certainly, uh, the bulk of us have said NetStap. Some people said, oh, how can I identify all of my computer's network connections? I can use IP config. There's some of you that said trace route. Well, certainly trace route can be used to identify the route that a single path might take to an external site, but it can't identify all of my computer's network connections, so that would not apply. Ping would not apply. That simply provides me with an uptime and see if a device is available on the network. IP config shows me the configuration of the network settings of my computer, but it cannot identify all all of my network connections that are going out there and connecting to other servers and other devices, which really leaves us with the netstat command. And that is the right answer. If you're trying to determine what program is talking to what server, over what port number, using what IP addresses, you can look at every single connection that your computer is making to the outside world using the netstat command. An incredibly powerful troubleshooting tool that you need to know about for your CompTIA exam especially if they want to give you a performance-based question that says use NetStat to find this information. You're going to need to know exactly how that works. Very, very, very useful to have that. Some folks in the chat room said, oh, I'll just use Wireshark. And Wireshark is a, is a packet capture program. So you can see what, where your computer might be communicating to out on the internet. And that certainly would show you network connections, but it would not show you what executable on your computer caused that network traffic to communicate across the network. So it may be a combination of things. You may be using Wireshark to see the actual packets, to see the actual data inside of that information. But ultimately, you're going to want to use NetStat if you want to determine what executable caused that information to go across the network to even begin with. Very, very, very useful to be able to know that information. I love doing these pop quizzes. I like having you guys available to see if uh, keep me honest and see this information that we are going across. Let's keep going with our questions that we had come in. I want to go to the next one that we had came in. And I kind of answered this one earlier. Our next question is, after passing the 22801, how long should I study before taking the 22802 exam? And Ben asked this one. This is a question that comes up quite a bit. Now, first, you need to know that there is, is no time in taking these exams. There's no, there's no time out. There's no expiration associated with this. If you take the 801 exam, you can take the 802 exam the same day. Instantly, you can take the 802 exam a week from now. You can take the 802 exam anytime before it is retired because ultimately the 802 exam will go away. It may go away in two years or three years, but it will go away. So you want to be sure to at least take it between that. I usually recommend if somebody's just going in to take one of these exams for the very first time, I really recommend that you take one exam one day and at least wait another day. Let's say you're ready to go with both of them. You studied up for both exams. You're ready to make it happen, and you really want to take them back to back. If it's your first exam, wait at least a day. 
because you'll go into your first exam and you'll now understand the process. What kind of room am I going to be in? What type of things will I see on the screen? What's the actual presses and keystrokes and the, the method for taking the exam? Sometimes that's, that's very stressful if you've never taken one of these exams before. You have no idea what to expect. So I like to have people think about that for at least a day. And if you really, really, really want to take it quickly and you want to go back, take it the next day. Now, if you've taken these exams before and you feel like you're ready for the content, you can take them back to back. Many people do. Another thing to keep in mind with the 800 series exam is it's not like the 700 series. The 700 series had a quest. 701 asked you what a SATA drive was. The 702 asked you to troubleshoot the SATA drive. So it was very easy to combine those things together in your mind. But it doesn't work that way with the 801 and the 802. So make sure you look over the exam requirements so that you know what is expected of you on both of those exams. It's a different format. So make sure when you're trying to figure out when you should study, how much you should study, and the information you're going to need to know, make sure you keep that in mind. Here's a question from Gary. Gary asks, do you leave anything out of your videos? I leave an exceptional amount of information out of my videos. There's absolutely nothing on geography. I've never been good in physics, so there's no physics in any of my videos. And quite honestly, art is not my, my strong suit. So there's no artistic ability whatsoever in any of these bones. But if you need to know every possible thing for a CompTIA exam, I have taken the exam requirements document. I have ripped it apart. I've taken every single topic from the exam requirements document, and I've created videos of those. So if we're, we're saying, did I leave anything out of your videos when you compare it to the exam requirements document? Absolutely not. Every single topic is in there. If you want to know what's in my exam, and I've mentioned this a couple of times, there's an exam requirements document that you can get at CompTIA. At the top of the video index page on my website, there is a link to download the objectives. It's the first link up there. Download the objectives. Before you even get to the videos, there's a link to download the objectives. The reason I put it at the top is it's very, very, very important. So, so also keep that in mind. Download those objectives. And here's a crazy idea. Read them. Make sure you look through them. A lot of people come into the chat all the time and they ask, is this topic on the exam? Hey, is this particular piece of information on the exam? They would know if they had downloaded the exam objectives. And my answer to them is, you absolutely need to download these objectives. I'm not going to tell you the answer. You need to go download them because they're so valuable. These make a great checklist if you're trying to determine how, if you're ready to take the exam, do I know everything I need to know? You can just go down the list and check off. Yep, I know that. SATA drives, I, I know exactly how many SATA drives connect to a motherboard. Check. Oh, I need to know about laser printer components. I know that. Check. Oh, I need to know about Netstat. Yep, know that one. Check mark. And then you can look at that list and see how many things have you checked off? How many things did you kind of check off but not really sure about? How many things did you not touch at all? Now you need to know, now you know exactly what you should go back and study, the things that you need to know. Very, very, very useful to have that there. And uh, make sure you download your exam requirements document regardless of what exam you're taking. CompTIA puts a ton of information in these exam requirements. So I highly, highly, highly recommend that you download those so that you can find them, be able to access everything that you need to know for the exam. It's, it's remarkable how detailed these exam requirements are. Question I got, I got this one Friday. If some of you are getting my daily pop quiz every day. If, if you ha aren't getting this, you can go to my website and the right-hand side, you can sign up to get an email every day with a CompTIA A plus exam question. And I'll ask you a question a day. I send it to your email. If you, uh, if you subscribe to me on Twitter, if you've connected to me there, it goes on, on my tweets every morning. So you'll see it come through on my Twitter. If you're on Facebook, unfortunately, Facebook won't show you every posting. You have to go to my Facebook page to see it, but I put them there as well. And I put all of those on there. Make sure that you do that, uh, that if you're interested in being able to get those questions every day, you do that. Well, the question I asked Friday was one, um, it, was about, it was about the speed of a SATA interface. If you have a SATA revision 3.0 interface, what speed would you expect that SATA interface to have? And a, a, a response I got back from someone was, why do I have to memorize these details? I can go to Google and I can look up what I need to know. 
I shouldn't have to go to all of these pieces and memorize all of these all the time. It just doesn't make sense to me to be able to have to memorize a memory speed, to be able to have to memorize the SATA pieces, to be able to memorize all of these other other pieces of that. And, and if you think about that, there, this is one of the things that's a challenge for us as technical people. There's a lot of technical details we have to know. And on the A-plus exam, there are a lot of technical things that we have to know that are on there. The challenge we have as technical people is we are almost always under some type of time constraint. If somebody came to you and was having a problem with a SATA connection, with the throughput to across the network to a SAN that had SATA drives inside of it, and they're saying, we're not getting the throughput we would expect, you're going to need to know what those different components are and what type of throughputs they have and figure out what type of connection is that to the SAN. Within the SAN, what type of drives are there? What type of hardware is within the SAN? What type of speeds should I expect? And your end users aren't going to wait for you. Hold on. I need to Google the speed of the network. Okay, now, okay, I got that. I need to Google what the speed of... You can sort of see this. We can almost apply that argument to everything in the world. Why, why memorize anything? Why, why memorize your address? I can simply look it up in Google if I need to know that. Those types of things are, are it's, it's an argument that's a difficult one for me to get through. Um, the, there are places and real world examples on the exam that these things apply to. And although you may not understand exactly, because some of you may not even have worked in IT before, some of you are, are students in high school, some of you are in college, you haven't really had an opportunity to stand in the middle of a data center yet. And, and we understand that. that the A-plus exam is that entry-level exam. And you're just pummeled with information. You're pummeled with new words and acronyms and how fast does this drive go and how fast is that network setting. Well, that's because later on, knowing that information off the top of your head is going to be very valuable. And if somebody says, we're getting really bad throughput to this SAN, and you look at the specs of that SAN, it tells you this is, SAN, this is an old SAN, and it's a SATA revision one. And you can say to them, well, no wonder. You're only going to get one and a half gig a second throughput on that SATA interface. We may be able to increase the speed by moving it up to a SATA revision three, which would give me six gigabits per second. That would be really, really, that would be a huge amount of speed increase. Knowing that information becomes very, very valuable when you start troubleshooting those things. That, that is something that, that I understand is a challenge, and it's frustrating to have to understand these words and these meanings and the things that, quite honestly, you may not even run into for years to be able to deal with that piece. But do not worry. All of this information that you're learning does have a good reason. The information that's on the A-plus exam all applies to things that are in enterprise environments today. You don't have to know about serial ports anymore. You don't have to know about IRQ settings, specific IRQs for a parallel port. And the reason you don't have to know about those things is because we don't deal with them anymore. We have plug-and-play infrastructures. But if you took an A-plus exam 10 years ago, you needed to know that. The A-plus exam today is incredibly updated. All the things that are in there are things you need to know. So don't get too wrapped around the axle with that and worry that you may be learning something that's worthless because I assure you, everything in the A-plus exam applies to things that you're going to find in the real world. A pop quiz question. I love these pop quiz questions. I put a bunch in this one this month, didn't I? A lot of stuff in here for pop quiz. So during uh, boot time, what key, which key on the keyboard provides you with access to the Windows Advanced Options menu? If you're troubleshooting Windows, this is a really useful key to know on your keyboard. Don't answer in the chat room. Don't say it to anybody else. I um, need you to go to vote.rs and go to 460406 or take your QR code reader, snap that screen right there. That should take you to that page, 460406 during boot time. What key provides you with access to the Windows Advanced Options menu? And I've given you some examples, some options here for you to choose from. So multiple choice at least, so you can flip through those pieces. And the question is one that in this particular case didn't fool too many people. I think a few of you have used this key before. I think a few of you have needed to know <laughs> which key that is. And if you notice, it comes up every time your computer boots up. 
and it tells you to press this key if you need to go to the advanced options menu, and it's F8. So if you are working with a BIOS configuration, you may be asked to press F1. You may be asked to press the delete key. The BIOS setup is not the same thing as the Windows Advanced Options menu. Windows Advanced Options is F8. Boy, almost everybody there got that one. In the chat room, somebody says, oh, it's too bad. There's not a, not a standard for the BIOS key. I am so with you, Cat, in the chat room, because that's one you have to keep looking. And it goes by fast sometimes. You have to figure out, do I press F1? Do I press Delete? What key do I push to get to that? Very, very much of a challenge. But of course, these BIOS, um, uh, the BIOS software is made by different companies sometimes. They all have a different way to do things. Just another challenge we have as technical people to be able to keep track of what we need to know to make all of these things work together. My link of the moment this month is one that you may have seen before, but it's so good. I ran into a situation this month where I needed to have this piece of detail. So I wanted to run through my link of the moment again. This month, the link of the moment, I made a shortcut to it, bit.ly bit.ly slash computer dot computer dash ports. It is a computer hardware chart that goes into detail of what you need to know for A+, plus and then some. Many of you in the chat room, oh, yeah, I love that chart. I've seen this chart before. It's fantastic, and it is. They've got everything in here. So if you've never touched a SATA drive before, you know what the interface looks like. If you've never seen these types of memory modules before, they're listed on there. If you're trying to figure out a serial port, my laptop doesn't have a serial port anymore. There's a serial port and what they look like, both the DB9 or the DE9, which would be a better way to say it, and the DB25 is also on there as well. Very, very, very useful to be able to have this information available, and it's right there on the screen. So it's a nice sanity check as well before you go into your A-plus exam. Do I know what all these things are and how do they work and what I would connect to them and where? how are they used? And when would I use a device that has that interface on it? And how would I connect it? It's a nice way to go through. Uh, the person who put this together also sells a copy of the the uh, chart itself. Uh, I'm not associated. I don't, I don't know anything about that process. I don't gain any, any money for him selling these charts, but very, very nice to have. Or you can just download a PDF and have that PDF version on there as well. And makes a nice background for your, for your computer. Lots of details there on that piece. Well, we've come to the end of our A-plus study group for December. If you'd like to see what's going on with Professor Messer, I have both access on Facebook. You can find me easily if you go to professormesser.com slash Facebook or professormesser.com slash Twitter or professormesser.com slash Google Plus or professormesser.com slash YouTube. You go to one place, you can find me everywhere. Also want to thanks GTS Learning, our sponsors for the study group. They do a great job for us every month. I like what those guys are doing with their freestyle. You can, of course, get a free version of this, a trial version at professormesser.com slash freestyle. I've got another study group that I'm planning for January. We don't have the dates set quite yet, but you can always check back on the Professor Messer website at professormesser.com slash calendar. And of course, thank you. We had such a good time today. A lot of people in the chat room, a lot of conversations going back and forth, a lot of great questions I got from you. And I look forward to these questions every month. Thank you for sending them in. We will see you next month on the Professor Messer A plus study group.